Hi, my name is Christopher. My pronouns are he, him. I am a queer Catholic coming from Austin, Texas. I'm on staff at Q Christian Fellowship, and I am so excited to introduce to you the leader of our contemplative prayer service, Father Richard Rohr. Father Richard has been a Catholic priest for the last 50 years, following in the way of St. Francis of Assisi. He is a gracious, loving wisdom figure that has provided immense help for so many queer Catholics and Christians trying to reconcile their faith and their sexuality while continuing a prayer life. He also helped popularize the Enneagram since he published a book almost 20 years ago, helping Christians embrace their God-given personality. Our theme of making a way and the scripture verse associated with it is embodied so much by Father Richard's spiritual invitation to us. Isaiah quotes God speaking to us. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Father Richard has helped me and so many others make a way in the wilderness. How do I affirm so much of what I love about God and the church while letting go of the trash that oppressed me? Somehow, Father Richard's heart full of love and his mind full of contemplation is like a gentle hand leading me through that wilderness, pointing out new life springing up along the path. In this prolonged winter of the pandemic, winter of the seasons, and winter of our spirituality, perhaps this prayer service, even in a small way, can be a springtime of new experience with the Christ who embraces us all. Please welcome Father Richard Rohr. A word that you're probably hearing a lot from others, certainly now from me, is the word contemplative. Uh, it was already created by the early desert fathers and mothers because the word prayer was already that early in history being corrupted as a functional thing, a problem-solving thing, an asking questions of God thing, a talking God into things thing. And so they created another word that might point more toward an actual rewiring, a rewiring of this brain so that we processed reality in a different way. Prayer, therefore, became a change of consciousness and not a merely intercessory prayer or merely reminding God of what maybe you've forgotten God, uh, which, that functional thing that we allowed prayer to become. Now, what's happened because of our interface for about a century now with the Eastern religions is that they awakened a word that was already in the Catholic tradition, but fairly foreign to the later Protestant tradition, a word non-dual. Forgive me if it scares you, it shouldn't. Here's the way Western people process almost every thought that comes toward them. They either like it or they don't like it. That's why America is so angrily divided today, that they stop right there. They think it's their job to find immediate certitude with the answer they are comfortable with, the answer they're familiar with. So when you divide the great subtlety and mystery of every moment to two choices, Let's pick obvious ones today. Republican, Democrat, male, female, gay, straight, Catholic, Protestant, although that's not so big anymore, thank God. But it was in most of our history. And you presented people with those two alternatives and then said, choose one. You created the modern, even more postmodern world. Because all you needed was enough information. You didn't need transformation of epistemology, how you know what you know. 
You just needed information to prove your side of the dualistically framed question. Come on, admit that's true. It's the way every Western conversation goes and why every group uh, collapses in the liberal and conservative. Now, if you can be taught how to leave the frame open, don't descend into dualistic darkness. Those are, you know, two poles, but there's a whole bunch of frames between Republican and Democrat, between gay and straight, which is why things like the gender question have become so alive, that people have begun to see that in issue after issue, that just either or doesn't solve the subtlety and the mystery of human nature or divine nature. So we're gonna do a short little practice just to illustrate it, don't let the gong here uh, scare you. This isn't Buddhist. <laughs> the gong existed long before Buddhism existed. We just used bells in monasteries. And the ringing of the bell, bell had a preciseness to it, a momentary pulling of the psyche into the moment and our our moment of listening or prayer or reading or whatever then began so i'll do that and we're going to sit in silence which if you've never been trained how to not need not need that dualistic mind even five minutes is going to be hard for you but we're going to try it and I want you just, there's no doing it right. There's no succeeding. It's not winning, losing. Remember, that's the old paradigm. It's doing it. And that's why we use the word practice so much. Practicing piano, practicing basketball. You're just practicing leaving the field open. So don't hate yourself. If you can't do it, just stay in there. After about five minutes, I'll ring the gong again and I'll offer a prayer. Now that isn't too scary, is it? I hope not. Let's try it.
from this new silence, from this bigger place, may we speak, may we listen, may we understand. We don't have to be positional people, defending our positions. We don't have to be opinionated. We can now listen to the half-baked, half-formulated ideas of everybody and find the truth that might still be there. Our own half-baked ideas are one of them, and yet truth is hopefully still there. And that is your presence within us, Holy Spirit of God. And you are in the mistaken as much as the smart. You're in the heretic as much as the believer. Teach us how to know the difference. Teach us how to know what matters and what lasts. And may our prayer teach us so. Amen. Thank you, that was a very brief introduction, but I hope it gives you a taste of something that could, should change your life. Hi, my name is Richard Leantonio, and I want to welcome you to the Q Christian Fellowship Conference Sunday morning liturgical service. Part of the history and purpose of the liturgical service is to recognize, honor, experience, and enjoy the diversity of our fellowship, particularly the many in our midst who regularly worship using traditional historic liturgies. But maybe you're like, that's not my tradition, that's not my thing. The funny thing is, Growing up as an evangelical and a charismatic, it definitely wasn't my tradition and definitely was not my thing, until one thing led to another, and I found myself experiencing God through liturgical worship in dynamic and life-changing ways. My encouragement is just to try something new, approach it with an open heart, and see if you can experience the Spirit in a fresh way. Since literally everything in the past two years of pandemic has been weird, this service is no exception. At conference, we normally all share Holy Communion as a sign of our unity in Christ. While some groups have been using virtual communion during the pandemic, we will not partake in communion, but will observe a traditional service of morning prayer. This abstinence from communion can be a tangible act of lament, of acknowledging the pain that we must be distanced and cannot be together. While we carry this pain in our hearts, we look forward in hope to when we can celebrate the joy of each other's presence again and can share in that Holy Communion. I want to give a special and enormous thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who helped make this service possible as we made a quick transition to a entirely virtual conference, including everyone who volunteered to record some of the prayers that you will see as part of the service. All the words for today's liturgy will be displayed on the screen as well as available in a downloadable leaflet. Part of the beauty of the liturgy is that all you need to encounter God through the liturgy is right in front of you. No secrets, no special skills or background or history or spiritual depth or discernment required. No invisible hoops to jump through. The biblical, theological, historical, and spiritual riches of the church are literally right there in front of you to enjoy. Within the church's year, we are in the season following Epiphany, a time when we celebrate the saving significance of Christ's life and ministry among us as the Word made flesh. Much is said about Christ's birth, death, and resurrection. But in this time in between Christmas and Easter, we remember it is during Christ's life that we see broken people made whole, the hungry fed, Sinners forgiven, outcasts welcome, strangers befriended, social stratification disrupted, 
religious hierarchy confronted, kings terrified, and the good news proclaimed to the poor. Whenever and wherever Christ lives and walks among us, this is the time of God's favor. It is the day of salvation. And Christ lives and walks among us now, ready in us and through us to make broken people whole, to feed the hungry, to forgive sinners, to welcome outcasts, to befriend strangers, to disrupt social stratification, to confront religious hierarchy, and to proclaim good news for the poor. Let us pray. O Christ, who is the Word made flesh, who lives and walks among us, and by whose life we are saved, make a way for us, a way out of sin into justice, out of hatred into love, out of despair into hope, out of sadness into joy, that through us the world may find you to be the fountain of life flourishing, renewal, and joy. Amen. In the wilderness, clear out the way. Prepare in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Yeah.
open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the parent, and to the child, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. together Psalm 19 responsively by verse. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmaments show her handiwork. One day tells its tale to another and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language and their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out into all the lands and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has she set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a newlywed out of their chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run their course. 
it goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now that it springs forth, do you not perceive it? The guidance of Adonai is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of Adonai is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of Adonai are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of Adonai is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of Adonai is clean and endures forever. The judgment of Adonai are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now that it springs forth, do you not perceive it? By your teachings is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often they offend? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servants from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Adonai, my strength and my redeemer. Glory to the parent and to the child and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and it will be forever. Amen. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now that it springs forth, do you not perceive it? A reading from the book of Nehemiah. All the people of Israel gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which Adonai had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed Adonai, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped Adonai with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave explanation so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to Adonai your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of Adonai is your strength. Here ends the reading. Please pray with me the song of the wilderness. The wilderness and the dry land shall rejoice. The desert shall blossom and burst into song. They shall see the glory of Adonai, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weary hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to the anxious, be strong, fear not. Your God is coming with justice, coming with justice to save you. Then shall the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The ransomed of the Lord shall return with singing. Everlasting joy shall crown their heads. Joy and gladness shall overtake them and the sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Glory to God the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the church in Corinth, the 12th chapter. Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. 
For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, slave or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in one body, each of them as they choose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body we think of as less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles, or do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues, and do all interpret? but strive for the greater gifts. Here ends the reading. Please pray with me the Song of Mary. The wilderness and the dry land shall rejoice. The desert shall blossom and burst into song. My soul proclaims the greatness of Adonai. My spirit rejoices in you, O God, my Savior. For you have looked with favor on your lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. You, El Shaddai, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. You have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. The wilderness and the dry land shall rejoice. The desert shall blossom and burst into song. You have shown strength with your arm and scattered the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You have come to the help of your servant Israel, for you have remembered your promise of mercy, the promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The wilderness and the dry land shall rejoice. The desert shall blossom and burst into song. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of Adonai is upon me, because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of Adonai's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Here ends the reading. Blessed be Israel's Lord and God, for you have come and freed your own. You sent a mighty Savior born of David's house and for his throne. You have fulfilled the prophet's word to save us from our foes' intent as promised to our ancestors to keep your holy covenant. You swore this oath to Abraham to set us free from hostile might to worship you free from all fear in holiness before your sight. And this the child shall now be called the prophet to prepare your way salvation to your own by putting all our sins away. In the compassion of our God, the heavenly dawn shall bring Shine on those who dwell in fear and guide us in the way of peace and guide us in the way of peace. So about six weeks ago, I went to the doctor for what I thought was a routine doctor's visit. By the time I left, the doctor had told me I needed to see two additional physicians, including a surgeon, and have three rather specialized tests. Now it's important to note, I'm just fine as it turns out, but I did not know that at the time. I was utterly terrified, filled with fear. There was dryness in the back of my throat, sweaty palms. I was breathing shallowly, my heartbeat was very rapid, and my face showed my fear. My face is kind of like a children's novel, it's really easy to read. Did you know that fear is one of six core emotions? The others are anger, happiness, sadness, surprise, and disgust. And what is it that determines an emotion? When an external stimulus brings about a physiological response in our bodies, that is in fact what we call an emotion. I'll say that again. When an external stimulus brings about a physiological response in the body that can be measured, that is in fact an emotion. And there are six core emotions. Happiness, sadness, fear, anger, surprise, and disgust. Our emotions come from the midbrain, from the amygdala, 
and the hippocampus. They bypass the cerebral cortex. So we really don't have a conscious option when it comes to experiencing emotions. Those are decided for us at an internal level by our body. Now, our emotions are physiological responses to an external stimulus. Our feelings are very different. Feelings are triggered by our emotions. And our feelings are a very internal response to the emotions that come to us. Our feelings are very much based on our own experience of life, on our background, circumstances. Our feelings may or may not be rational. They may or may not be objective, but they are our feelings. And we do, in fact, get to have them. I'm a pastoral counselor by trade, and I don't work much with my clients on emotions because emotions have a mind of their own. On the other hand, we work a lot on feelings. Brene Brown and her team have identified 150 different feelings or experiences. She talks about over 80 of them in her new book, Atlas of the Heart. So what were the feelings that I experienced with the emotion of fear? Again, our feelings are very personal based on our own experience. In my case, the immediate feelings I had were panic, overwhelmment, and despair. You say, mm, wait a minute, this is just on the news? You have to have a few tests and see some specialists? Uh-huh, those were, in fact, my feelings. Why? Our feelings are always intensely personal based on our own experience. Whenever I was sick as a child, my mother was sure I was going to die. And immediately, she would be filled with fear. She would be overwhelmed. She would panic. And she would be in despair. And so she visited those feelings upon me. That's what we call intergenerational trauma. Well, the very fact that you're at the QCF conference indicates you probably have had a lot of feelings and a fair number of emotions related to the time you came out as an LGBTQ plus person, maybe to your family, maybe at work, or maybe in your church. And the emotions that came to you may not have been all that positive. They may have been primarily fear or anger or surprise. But whatever the case, we have to deal with those emotions and the feelings that are triggered by them. We are the Q Christian Fellowship. So how would a Christian then deal with these emotions that come to us? And how would a Christian deal with the feelings that we have that are triggered by those emotions? Well, I think we can deal with the feelings and the emotions with the help of the Trinity. With the help of the Trinity? Mm -hmm. Stay with me. There are three aspects to who God is. There is God the Creator. There is God the Spirit. And there is God the Christ. First, there's God the Creator, the God who burst on the scene 14 billion years ago in all of God's complexity, mystery, and ever-expansiveness, rooted in relationship and grounded in love. I'll say that again. The God of creation, the God who burst on the scene 14 billion years ago in all of God's mystery, complexity, and ever-expansiveness, rooted in relationship and grounded in love. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, uh, the first part of that is the Big Bang. Exactly. The second part of that are the discoveries quantum physics has made in the last couple of generations. One of the major discoveries of quantum physics is that the primary building blocks of the universe are not made of matter. The primary building blocks of the universe could be described as a pattern of relationships between non-material entities. I'll say that again. The basic building blocks of the universe could be described as a pattern of relationships between non-material entities. So if, in fact, the core building blocks of the universe are relationships, the most powerful force in the universe is love. It shows us that, in fact, the Apostle John, late in his life, understood exactly what he was saying in 1 John, the fourth chapter, when he said, God is love. Love is God. That's God 
the creator. There's also God the Spirit, the great comforter. God the Spirit is the repository of all things from the realm of spirit. Now, interestingly, the six core emotions, happiness, sadness, surprise, disgust, anger, and fear, are in fact phenomena that have existed in the ether since the beginning of time. They are in fact phenomena that come to us whether we invite them or not. They have a mind of their own. And they come from the realm of the Spirit, of God the Spirit. As such, all six of the core emotions that come to us from an external stimulus that brings about a physiological response in our being, all six are coming from the realm of the Spirit, and therefore, all six of those emotions are holy. And we actually have no choice as to whether or not we need to invite them in. They've been coming in, whether we want them to or not, for millennia. They bring their bags with them. They stay in the guest room. They eat all of our food. Rumi, in the 13th century, talked about the arrival of the emotions in his poem, The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. They may be clearing out some new delight for you. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door, laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. This is Rumi in the 13th century. The emotions have been coming to us, whether we want them to or not, for millennia. And they are coming from the realm of the spirit and therefore they are holy. So when you experience anger, you need to understand that anger is holy. It's a holy emotion coming into your holy body. You're feeling anger because you should be experiencing anger. A lot of us who were raised in the church think we're not allowed to be angry. You know, the Bible talks about God being angry five times as often as it talks about humans being angry. We're allowed to be angry. Anger is a holy emotion. The problem isn't being angry. The problem is when we remain too long, too angry. Because by the time you get into the third, the fourth course in the Feast of Anger, the food you're feasting on is you. It's you being devoured. But anger? Anger is a holy emotion. And we need to welcome anger when it comes to us. It's there for a reason. The same thing with sadness. And how many of us in the QCF world felt incredible, overwhelming sadness when we came out and we found ourselves rejected by the people we love, by the people we thought were going to accept us. And we had to walk away from those people. You know, we tend to think in America that grief is a problem to be solved. Grief is not a problem to be solved. Grief is an experience to be assimilated. That's right. Grief is not a problem to be solved. It's an experience to be assimilated. And grief will come to us when we are, in fact, sad and experience sadness. We experience grief when there is a loss. Grief is the internal experience of that loss. Mourning is the external expression of that internal experience of our loss. And we've always thought or been taught, certainly over the last generation or two, that our grief should be brief and it should be linear. Oh, that's not true at all. Dealing with the emotion of sadness is like crossing a bridge over and back and over and back from before the time you were sad to that which has brought about the sadness to the time after to before to after. The first thing we have to do when we're feeling great sadness, when we're having that experience in our bodies of sadness is to recognize the value of that which we lost. We have to go into the past, to that side of the bridge, 
what was the meaning that that relationship that we lost or that job we lost or the church that we lost, what was the meaning that that brought into our lives? And now we have to go over to the future side of the bridge and we have to do the most difficult part of dealing with sadness, grief, and mourning. We have to give up the notion that we, in fact, can control that which is uncontrollable. That loved one has died. There's nothing you can do about it. That person you thought you would be loving for the rest of your life now loves another, and there's not a thing you can do about it. You have to give up the notion of control. Well, now you have to go back to the south side of the bridge again, to the past. You have to reimagine what the relationship you had with that which is lost will be going forward. What does that church you lost mean to you now? What does that loved one who's gone mean to you now? What do they mean to you going forward? That job you no longer have, that profession you no longer have, what does it mean to you as you move forward? Now you have to go back to the future side of the bridge. You have to reimagine who you are and redefine yourself without that person, without that job, without that church. Who are you going forward? And now you have to go back to the other side of the bridge and be comfortable with your ambivalent feelings. And then eventually in the future side of the bridge, we, we find new hope. But it is a long process and it involves going back and forth and back and forth. All of the emotions are holy. The happiness that you're afraid to feel because when you were a child, your father literally beat it out of you, that happiness is a holy emotion. And you say, but wait a minute, a lot of these emotions, these visitors from afar, these phenomena that come into our lives, that come into our bodies through our midbrain and bring about a physiological response, a lot of them are kind of negative. Sadness, fear, anger, disgust. Didn't you just say the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, God's Spirit is a great comforter? Mm Mm-hmm. Because the Spirit tells us we must invite these emotions in. Let them stay in the guest room, unpack their bags, eat our food. But the Spirit also tells these emotions when it's time to leave. Anger, you've outstayed your welcome. It's time for you to go. Fear is no longer serving a purpose. It's time for you to go. The spirit is the realm that invites these emotions in and also tells these emotions when it's time to leave our holy bodies. There's God, the creator. There's God, the spirit, and there's God, the Christ, the prophet, priest, and king, The that which there ain't no witcher, the most powerful force in the universe, the Christ who has existed since before the beginning of time, permeating, suffusing every subatomic particle with the substance of love. It is the Christ who is love. So God, the creator, God, the spirit, God, the Christ are sitting together talking. The time has come. The time has come for the Christ to enter the earth in the form of a human, an infant, the person of Jesus, to show the crown of creation, humans, what love looks like in the flesh, how to love God, love neighbor, and maybe the hardest of all, how to love ourselves. This Jesus will come As an infant, the Christ will come to earth in the form of a person. And now is the time. And Gabriel has been sent to deliver the message. And now Gabriel returns. God the Spirit, God the Creator, God the Christ are sitting with their hearts in their throats because they know the future of humanity is hanging on the answer of a girl. And Gabriel says, she said, yes. And God came to live among us, to show us that in the end, love wins. God the Creator shows us that love wins. God the Spirit shows us that love wins. 
God, the Christ, in the form of Jesus shows us solidarity in our suffering because love wins. So I'd had all the medical tests. I was waiting for a call from the doctor. I was sitting in the big kind of overstuffed chair in my living room, looking at the six clay pots that sit up above the kitchen cabinets. I always imagined them as either empty or full, sometimes empty of my children's love, sometimes or full of my children's love, more often full of their love. Sometimes empty of pain, sometimes full of pain. Sometimes empty of the presence of God, sometimes full of the presence of God. All the things we love, they all come and go. They are all elusive to us. This day, the only thing in those pots was pain. Again, I was full of fear. My former wife came in the house. We're both psychotherapists. She had a client in the office we shared together there. And I said to her, I don't know how to deal with the emotion of fear that I'm having. I said, the whole time we were married, I was like most men. I was letting you experience my emotions for me, and I was letting you tell me what the feelings are that I should have and asking you to feel those feelings for me, which was so unfair. But since I transitioned from Paul to Paula, I've learned to feel those feelings myself. And now I was feeling that same sense of despair and panic and overwhelmment as my body experienced the emotion of fear. And I said, Kathy, what do you do? She said, look up at the pots. Are they full or are they empty? I said, they're full of pain. She said, empty them out and invite your angels to come around you. I did. And they did. First, a Rilke poem came to mind that matched the weather of the day. A poem about yielding to a storm. A poem about recognizing that winning does not tempt the wise person. It is being defeated decisively by constantly greater beings. That, that is what calls them to be defeated by God. And then a Mary Oliver poem that brought me great comfort in the midst of my fear. A poem I bring to you today from my body to yours. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meantime, the sun and the clear pebbles of rain are moving across the landscapes, over the valleys, the mountains, the prairies, the rivers, and the deep trees. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are headed home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. It calls to you like the wild geese, harsh, exciting, over and over again. Announcing your place, your place, your body's place in the family of things. God, thank you for giving us these bodies. May we understand they are holy, the emotions they experience, the feelings. They are all holy. And let us bring these bodies into your presence, knowing that in the arms of the Christ, in the arms of Jesus, we will remember that love wins. Amen. Oh, my baby, when you're older, Understand, you have.
of angels to dance around your shoulders Cause at times in life you'll need a helping hand Oh my baby when you're playing Leave your burden by my Standing at your bedside To keep you calm Keep you safe away from harm Worry not my daughters Worry not my sons Child, when life don't seem worth living Let him hold you in his arms Oh, my baby, when you're crying Never hide your face from me I have conquered hell and driven out the demons I have come with a light to set you free his hand here in heaven we will wait for your arrival here in heaven you will finally understand here in heaven we will in your cells all you in private hells Kyrie all you hungry and ignored who thirst for something more Kyrie you who feel so lost but are afraid of being found You who are in chains But are afraid to live unbound Kyrie eleison Kyrie eleison For all us lovely needy people 
join me in confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Mother Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only child, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated 
at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Holy God, creator of heaven and earth, have mercy on us. Holy and mighty, redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. Holy, immortal one, sanctifier of the faithful, have mercy on us. Holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. For persons of all sexual and gender diversity, we thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for a gender androgynous and bigender persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for gender fluid, gender nonconforming, and gender queer persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for non-binary, pangender, and third gender persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for intersex persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for bisexual, pansexual persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for lesbian and gay persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for queer and questioning persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for aromantic and asexual persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for gray romantic and gray sexual persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for demi-romantic and demisexual persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for transgender persons. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts for the beauty, dignity, and diversity of your entire creation. We thank you for their lives. We honor their presence. We welcome their gifts. For preferring division over unity. We turn from sin toward justice and love. For preferring isolation over community. We turn from sin toward justice and love. For preferring greed over generosity. We turn from sin toward justice and love. For preferring apathy over engagement. We turn from sin toward justice and love. For preferring arrogance over solidarity. We turn from sin toward justice and love. For preferring appearance over a substance. We turn from sin toward justice and love. For preferring appeasement over justice. We turn from sin toward justice and love. For preferring tokenism over true inclusion. We turn from sin toward justice and love. For preferring defensiveness over openness and listening. We turn from sin toward justice and love. God who weeps with those who weep and is afflicted with all our afflictions. Suffering God be near for those being bullied. Suffering God be near for those rejected by family. Suffering God be near 
for those thrown out of churches. Suffering God, be near for those victimized by sexual violence. Suffering God, be near for those living with HIV. Suffering God, be near for those facing mental illness. Suffering God, be near for those encountering barriers to healthcare. Suffering God, be near for those considering ending their life. Suffering God, be near. For courage to live with humility. God of resurrection, send your spirit. For courage to see with compassion. God of resurrection, send your spirit. For courage to listen despite difference. God of resurrection, send your spirit. For courage to reach across divides. God of resurrection, send your spirit. For courage to love without condition. God of resurrection, send your spirit. For courage to stand with the oppressed. God of resurrection, send your spirit. For courage to fight for true justice. God of resurrection, send your spirit. For courage to persevere to the end. God of resurrection, send your spirit. We perceive the groaning of creation and acknowledge our part. We turn from sin toward justice and love. We perceive the groaning of creation and stand in solidarity. Suffering God, be near. We perceive the groaning of creation and take responsibility to act. God of resurrection, send your spirit. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that the things which were cast down are being raised up, and things that had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by the one through whom all things were made, your child, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved child that when two or three are gathered in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Sound the Savior comes, the Savior promised long. Let every heart prepare a throne and every voice a song. On Christ the Spirit largely poured, entered in sacred fire. Wisdom and might and zeal and love their holy breast inspire. Christ comes the prisoners to release in evil's bondage held. The gates of brass before them burst, the iron fetters 
The prison doors are open now, in shines the sun's bright ray. And on the eyes oppressed with night, Christ pours celestial day. Christ comes the broken heart to bite, the bleeding soul to cure. And with the treasures of their grace, enrich the humble poor. Christ's silver trumpets publish loud the day of Our debts are all remitted now. God sets their people free. The time long waited has arrived, the pleasure of our God. When heaven's high promise is fulfilled, the earth is now restored. Our glad hosannas, Prince of Peace, thy welcome. Oh, okay.